Okay, good morning, everybody. Hello and welcome. So why is this first webinar of 2023? Uh, why is it talks drones in science and industry? I'm Derek Robinson. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Geography and uh, Environmental Management. And I'm also an associate director for WISA here at the University of Waterloo. I'd like to send a big thank you out to our community of industry and government partners, students, staff, faculty, and friends who have joined us virtually today. And I want to welcome our in-person students enrolled in geography and aviation course titled Remotely Piloted Aircraft Systems, Knowledge Requirements. And before we begin, I want to, um, and the University of Waterloo would like to acknowledge that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the Neutral and Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is located in the Haldeman Tract, which consists of the six miles on each side of the Grand River that was granted to the Six Nations. And our active work toward reconciliation takes place across our campus through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is coordinated within our Office of Indigenous Research and Relations. Now, WISE is a research institute at the University of Waterloo with a mission to be the world's leading hub for sustainable aeronautical research, technology, and education. The core of our work is to foster interdisciplinary research, cross-sector partnerships, and experiential learning towards sustainable future for the aeronautical sector. So thank you for joining us again in this Wise Talks webinar, within which we'll bring together panels of academic and industry leaders for a deep dive into the significant challenges and opportunities facing the future, social, environmental, and economic sustainability of the aeronautics sector. At Wise, we consider the three pillars of sustainability, economics, environmental, and social. In our previous webinars, we've discussed each of these pillars in great detail. Um, those webinars, along with today's and future webinars, are available on our YouTube channel if you would like to see those. So today's Wise It Talks, Drones in Science and Industry, we'll hear about a variety of applications of drones that involve remote sensing, mapping, crop spraying, real estate, and infrastructure inspection, among others, from our panelists, as well as discuss the challenges they faced in the drone space and how they've had to overcome them. Before we start, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. We have Dan Chaudhry and Nat DeLorenzis, uh, who are co-founders and partners from uh, SkySight Incorporated. We have Omar Jinich, who is a drone and geomatics specialist with GHD. We have Adrian Rivard, who is the president and operations manager for Drone Spray Canada. And we have Ryan Rizzo, who is chief executive officer for TerraSky. So once again, I'm Derek Robinson. And before I call on our industry panelists to, to present their work, I'm going to spend a few minutes going and presenting some of the ways that my research program and team of students have been using drones to advance science. Then each panelist will present for eight to 10 minutes, and afterwards we'll have a Q&A session. So our team here at the University of Waterloo has been involved in a whole host of different scientific applications of drones. And that's really taken place because my passion is in modeling human decision making and looking at how humans interact with the environment and how they're affected by the environment. But when we build those kinds of models, what we find is that a lot of the natural system models are validated and calibrated at scales that are much larger than the scales at which we make decisions. So natural system models that are, are working and operating at, for example, a river basin or a watershed level. But most of us are making decisions at the scale of a, of a property parcel or farmers at the scale of a farm field. And so that got me into the idea of how can we collect data that represents those scales of, of natural system processes, and that took us into drone operations. So the exciting part for our team, we're constantly bringing in different types of equipment to get a holistic uh, vision, a holistic representation of what's happening on, for example, a farm field or in an urban area. So I'm going to run through a bunch of different types of applications that we've been doing um, to advance science, one of which has been plant mapping. So we've had students go up into the high altitude regions of the Colorado Rockies, where we've been mapping plant communities, um, wetland plant communities. We've been out in different wetlands around southern Ontario, trying to map phragmites. And what's, it, what's amazing about this, to the ability to change our altitude of the equipment, we can actually get centimeter level resolution data, which means that we can identify individual stocks and phragmites plants. Okay. And this has taken us into other areas in terms of uh, looking at crop and ecosystem health with common metrics like uh, NDVI, 
but also individual plant mapping with uh, different plants inside milkweed, which is essential habitat for monarch butterflies. So uh, what we've done uh, on that type of project is we systematically change the altitude of the aircraft. We look at different types of flight parameters and see how we can accurately capture the count, the size, and um, different information. What's also exciting is there's been incredible advances in image classification that enables us to automate the identification of these individual plants. So when we get down to the sub-centimeter level in terms of our image resolution, we can actually use object-based image analysis to identify individual plants within our data, which is really exciting. And there's all kinds of different uses in industry and government for it could be used as a proof of success for a permit closure when there's been um, some sort of resource extraction and they are uh, rehabilitating um, the, the landscape and they need to prove that they have rehabilitated that. Insurance or warranty claims for different types of uh, plants and other features that have been put in the landscape. And there's a myriad of other uses. We also do a lot of work in carbon accounts. Okay. And this is, uh, takes place at a number of different scales. The national scale, where we've got national greenhouse gas inventories, but also the municipal scales, where they're looking at natural asset management. And so we are typically using LIDAR data for these types of work and using those data to create a benchmark because there really is a lack of a benchmark of how much carbon is stored in urban areas, for example. And so we can actually use LIDAR, use different sensors to generate new kinds of data. We can challenge existing approaches, in this case, for how we assess and measure carbon, quantify the error and uncertainty associated with carbon, and automate uh, procedures like we just talked about with the plant identification for estimating carbon. Then taking this back to how humans are involved, we can then start to see how the individual decisions of each property owner aggregate to affect citywide um, canopy cover, carbon surge, and those sorts of things also even kind of dabbled in archaeology. So um, my grad student, Brandon Guerra, and I have gone to the United Kingdom to work at Hurstmont Sioux Castle in, in uh, southeast England. And um, here we've used a variety of sensors, including LIDAR, to try and isolate the topographic variations in the landscape to see if we can uncover artifacts in the landscape or building footprints that have been covered over time. So this is a huge 600 acre estate where we've looked at uh, areas where there was a 1940s Royal Air Force base in the UK trying to undercover um, uh, building that used to take place there. There's old Roman ruins that we've tried to identify uh, new features that haven't been extracted and then provide some really exciting visuals of the castle itself. Now that same process for acquiring the terrain to look at and see what kind of geometric features might be underlying that natural system for archaeology is also something we can use to uh, better understand stormwater runoff. So here's a, a point cloud generated uh, from a neighborhood in Kitchener, Ontario, where we can then strip the landscape next slide, please, with, uh, of the trees and the vegetation and the homes to get a digital terrain model, an accurate representation of our topography at a very high resolution. So we're typically on the order of one to two centimeters. And through this type of data, we can then start to see how water is flowing between neighbors and across neighborhoods to better identify the susceptibility of different parcels, different homes to flooding, based on floods and those sorts of things. This is just a, a cross section that better emphasize our ability to isolate individual trees, for example, or homes, and then Again, look at the slope and the variation in the landscape that resides underneath what we, we have difficult seeing um, without sensors like LiDAR. We've taken the same kind of approach into the agricultural sector as well. We've done a lot of work on trying to quantify erosion. In the past, erosion was quantified with pins where we could see how much the soil would move above and below the pins that are out there. But, what drone data allows us to do is get a full spatial representation. And that's pretty exciting because we can go over the drone anytime. So we can monitor this field. We went out 12 times over the course of a year to look at some of these artifacts of uh, flow of uh, runoff and how in this particular farm, the farmer knew that there was erosion happening. So they put in a bunch of berms and they have some uh, drainage inlets. They have tile drainage on the field as well to try and mitigate that erosion that's happening. 
and we went out and we had, still identified a huge volume of erosion that was taking place. Uh, as you can see here, these areas in red are identifying areas where the soil is built up on these berms. And by doing surface change detection, we can then actually quantify how much was happening. So a farmer was going in at the end of the year, taking 20 to 40 bucket loads of soil back up on the field, pulling it into the field. And, uh, and the soil movement was incredible. Within one month, it was enough to fill six minivans just in one small section of this 40 acre property, uh, farm field. And these are just a couple examples of how uh, my research program and team here at the University of Waterloo are using drones. If this is something of interest to you, then please email us. And um, what we're going to do next is have our industry panelists take over. Of course, we've got different funding support um, for these projects. But now what we're going to do is we're going to have our industry partners come up and, and give uh, some information about the types of ways that they're using drones and the challenges they face. And first, I'd like to uh, welcome Adrian Rivard to come up. Adrian is the President and Operations Manager at Drone Spray Canada. Adrian spent 15 years as a professional pilot, piloting single engine float plans up to being the captain of Embraer 175. He left the flight deck to come back to his family, uh, to a family farm in Blenheim, Ontario, and his combined background in both aviation and agriculture makes drone spray experts in the field of agriculture. So please join me in welcoming Adrian up to the front. Thanks, Derek. So, uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, yeah, as Derek said, uh, we're into our third year of uh, drone uh, applications, so we specialize more so in. Uh, we've done a lot of drone mapping, uh, the agricultural sector as well. Uh, again, myself, 15 years. Uh, next one. And then um, going back to Chatham, uh, Lenham, uh, 2018, run the family farm. Uh, as I said, this is everything. Uh, started flying as a teenager, little model airplanes, kind of like. Um, licensed aerial and uh, agricultural applicator. Uh, Brian's not with me today, but uh, he started with the company a couple months ago. Uh, he's also a drone pilot, sort of business development guy, and uh, he was born and raised on the farm, 13 years in ag retail, and also 13 years in crop and crop protection research. He's also an instrument here. All right, so that's our company. Let's go spray some uh, pesticides. <laughs> Let's like say some Roundup. That'd be great. Yeah, we can't do that. Uh, so early in the industry, a bunch of pioneers kind of decided that drones, of course, have small payloads. Let's go and spray at like two liters to the acre, and that's a really, really high concentration of pesticides. In order to get that coverage on the plants, you got to go with really fine droplets to actually get that on the what you're actually trying to spray. Those are very prone to drift, and of course, since every every droplet is basically a nuke with whatever pesticide you're using, it's very, very dangerous for the environment. That's not really a great thing to do. Um, so they basically set an outright ban on basically every pesticide out of their own. They don't see it as an aerial, they don't see it as a ground application. So there's different uh, organic products people always try to get us to apply. Uh, this is my poster child. Um, it's uh, called Vegol. Uh, the active ingredient is canola oil, uh, 96%, it's a miticide. Uh, so again, a lot of workers and stuff will put this out, you know, the last this stuff. It does have a uh, PCPA number, which means that it's pesticide. Uh, so I asked my friends at Health Canada, and I said, hey, uh, obviously I can't apply this because it's illegal. If I go to Costco and buy some canola oil and put it to the drone, is that illegal? And they said, yes, we're still using an active ingredient to control the pest, so it really limits what we can do. Next um, one. Uh, so yeah, aren't other countries doing this already? Yeah, in the States. Uh, the EPA, their version of Health Canada, uh, would mitigate the, or regulate the uh, pesticides. They say if it's an aerial label, you can use it on a drone, uh, but they're the kind of opposite. Uh, the FAA says, well, if you're doing uh, extermination or modifying plant biology, you need to be basically the same licensing as a helicopter company or an aircraft company, so Part 137. Uh, that takes about a year and a half to get those uh, approvals, uh, but they're happening. Um, yeah. Drones have been used a lot. Again, when I was flying model airplanes, it was like, oh, those little helicopters are flying rice paddies in Japan. It's coming someday soon. Um, and again, one of the big things, though, is a lot of this stuff that's been going on is mostly in Asia, and there's a lot of differences in practices in the spray and agriculture there versus here. Uh, so we'll take a quick trip around the world. 
in North America. So video. When we talk about spraying, everybody thinks more about this sort of stuff versus in um, Asia. Go ahead. This comes under DJI's marketing for their MG series. Uh, this is about five, six years ago. <laughs> so you'll notice big differences the way their fields are planted. It makes no sense versus here. They're small fields, kind of weird pockets. And again, um, talking tons of coverage. And their method of conventional sprinting, they show right here. Yeah, the backpack. This totally night and day, a big giant sprayer like that versus the guy with the backpack. It's completely different. And also notice the guy with the backpack has no face mask and PPE on. That's not how we do things here. Um, it was actually kind of funny on Twitter the other day. I was talking to Jason DeVoe. There's a guy who's trying to sell some stuff from China and like these like air blast sprayers who walk behind. And on all their public, like their promo videos, there's guys walking with it like in flip flops. It's like, like here. Uh, so anyways, real quick, um, yeah, North America, big pool machines, uh, big capacity. We spray a lot of uh, carrier, so we're spraying three to five gallons per acre uh, to go and use the drones uh, versus in Asia or other parts of the world where they're trying to get down below two, like really, really low uh, volumes. So that means you can cover more uh, Yeah, over in Asia, um, still using backpack sprayers and weird equipment. Um, backpacks, so weight is a big prep, uh, factor. I and mean, one of the polar fertilizer companies I work with, Alpine, they usually here in North America sell the stuff by the jugs and by giant totes. But they have in Asia, they sell fertilizer by 100 milliliter bottles. And that's actually designed to pour right into a backpack. So it's just completely different ways of doing things. Uh, yeah, you can find spray. Uh, operator exposure is everywhere. Next one, please. And here's an extreme example. Also, from there. It's cooler when you can hear it because I don't totally wrap the engines on the cube. <laughs> you would never see this here. <laughs> and that's actually really good at staying together. Like, it's not their first day on the job. <laughs> so, yeah, big differences. And that's why everyone's saying, oh, they're in other parts of the world. Well, yeah, but we all have different standards. That next one. Uh, that's basically what this slide says. Uh, in Asia, again, they kind of mix the set. Skip the generation. They never went to this sort of stuff. They here in North America, we've had more progression in the technology. Um, so yeah, we're not really comparing apples to apples versus like a field sprayer. So our drones little aircraft. Makes sense. Right? They're off the ground. Uh, go ahead. So when I look at an airplane spraying, this is what we see. The trees aren't moving. Just laying a nice, pretty swath. That's how it goes. Time to a drone spray, this is at three gallons to the acre. All those turbulence. That's what we're dealing with. That's what makes these things really prone to drift. And uh, what really, again, makes it complicated to spray and spray accurately. So there's a huge difference in flight dynamics. If you're looking at an aircraft versus a drone, what keeps a drone from being on Mother Earth is thrust, right? An aircraft, whether it's a helicopter or an airplane, generating lift. The helicopter is spinning a wing, making lift. Uh, they have limitations, like the nozzles can't be more than 60% of the rotor span or wingspan, that's so that you're out of the wing to vortices and to clean air, so you can actually lay a swat. Drones, again, the only thing keeping that off the ground is thrust. These little guys shut off, trust me, it goes down. You know, there's no glide, there's no auto rotate. So that's where, again, drones, we're working at moving two fluids. We're moving both the air and the actual spray in that air. Uh, next please. So in orchards, you'll see a like an air blast sprayer. It's a fan that's blowing chemicals. But it's kind of our best analog. But you see it's moving vegetation, blowing chemicals in there. That's how that essentially works. Uh, here again, we're doing uh, an orchard application with the drone. And you'll notice again, it's blowing stuff right into the crop. And actually, this is part of a residue study that we did uh, last couple of years for the uh, Agri-Foods Canada. And their comparison spray is at 1,200 liters per hectare with a ground air blast sprayer versus us at 60 liters per hectare uh, with the drone. 
So they take the cherries and then they harvest them, test them for efficacy and residues. And we're actually the same efficacy as the air blast sprayer with a fraction of the water. Uh, same thing with the residues. So that's a big concern that the government has. The residues are very similar. So yeah, lots of data to be collected on the spray drone stuff. Everybody's super excited about it. Uh, but there's a whole lot of different parts to the puzzle. It's not just as easy as throwing camera on the drones and one fly. So you're yeah, chasing DeVoe and I throw on some UV dyes at the drone just to get kind of an interesting see where the spray goes. At night time we go with UV lights and uh, see where it goes. It's kind of fun. It makes the drones look like a rave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is again things that can happen with the spray drones. You'll see two tracks here. This is actually out of a DGI T10. Uh, it's easy to do things like this. Um, here's a whole list of things that can cause that to happen. Um, and again, so when we're talking about residues and proper deposition of the actual drone, uh, if you have, like, say, two, three times the, the chemical here versus here, where it's almost actually here, this, this is an herbicide, this stuff's still alive. Um, it's just not easy to kind of say, well, this is safe food to eat, this is not safe food to eat, or again, if we're looking into resistance problems. The way that um, we have resistance is things like this. Uh, if you're giving pro uh, plants a sub lethal dose, and it's developing tolerance to that product. So if it's glyphosate, for example, let's keep on getting sniffs and sniffs and it doesn't die. Well, now the next couple generations will be glyphosate resistant, and now we lose that tool, and we have to find new chemistries to beat this with. Uh, yeah, one of the things we do too is, um, oh, that's fine. We, uh, <laughs> But these rolls, they're like calculator tape, probably a grandpa's old adding machine. And we spray blue dye over it on these boards. Anyway, looks like this. And so we take these rolls after it makes those nice little specks everywhere. And looks like this. And then we run it through this machine. I'm getting the first production model. Um, out of my buddy out in uh, Lansing, and so we can actually model um, the spray deposition, count drops, or again coverage. Uh, when you look at this, uh, if you were looking at a field sprayer, you would see more of a flat top, a nice uniform. Here are these dips. This is what causes that streaking. So it's again the application technology still has a long ways to go before we actually have a nice proper slot. So we work a lot trying just to get sprayers to work right. Chat for today. Yeah, and thanks a lot. Next up, we've got Dan, Dan Chowdhury and Nat Lorenzis uh, from SkySight Incorporated. Both Dan and Nat graduated with a bachelor's degree from the University of Waterloo. Dan from Geography and Aviation, and Nat in Geography, specializing in Geomatics. Dan is a commercially licensed pilot and Transport Canada Advanced RPAS Operator and Reviewer, and that's also an Advanced RPAS Operator. After graduating, the two, along with other University of Waterloo graduates, co-founded SkySight Incorporated, which delivers professional services, media, and training solutions that leverage the latest RPAS and 3D modeling technologies. So please join me in welcoming Dan and that. Present. My name is Dan, and this is Nat, and uh, we started uh, Sky State a couple of years ago after we graduated. So first we'll talk about a little bit uh, about us, I guess, uh, so next slide. Uh, I'll go first. So uh, as Dirk mentioned, I graduated from the Geography and Aviation Program um, in 2020, right as uh, COVID hit. Uh, so my original dream was to be a pilot, a commercial pilot, but that just wasn't an option. There weren't any jobs. so. I thought, well, why not uh, start this company with a few friends and uh, see where that goes? And so that's what I did. I have my Diploma of Excellence in GIS. Um, I also have uh, a CPL uh, Group 1 IFR and Class 4 Flight Instructor Rating. Um, I have my RPAS uh, Advanced and uh, I'm a Flight Reviewer as well. Um, when I was at the university, I uh, co-founded, or actually I founded the uh, U Waterloo Aviation Society and was its president for the first uh, two years. Uh, so I was quite involved on campus and, and networking with a bunch of people, so that was really good. Um, and when I graduated, I had the opportunity to uh, be involved with WISA, 
and uh, I was a flight simulator researcher <laughs> there. Um, I also work on a, uh, a project in aviation at the university where I was a research lecturer, um, teaching a little bit about stalls and a, a few other things. Um, and then I founded, uh, co-founded uh, SkySight. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Nat, and I also Waterloo, and actually Dan and I were both in Derek's class, yeah. and that's kind of how I got my yeah. drones, and uh, like really more the application of where we use drones. Uh, after uh, a while, I was in university, I also worked a little bit at um, in Canada and at the Weather Network doing remote sensing. where I wanted to go, um, but then we started to get the okay. Next slide. So a little bit about what we do in our company. Um, we basically are a uh, firm that provides uh, professional services, digital media, and uh, training solutions that leverage uh, drones and 3D technology. Um, so we have three sectors that we uh, do, which is, as I mentioned, professional services, drone uh, media, and training, and so a little few videos there that show some of the stuff we do. Um, on the next slide, so this uh, dives a little bit deeper into the specific services that we provide. Um, on the professional side, we do 3D models um, and uh, building plans as well as building information models. Um, we also provide full architectural services in partnership with a uh, architectural firm um, where we're able to use our drone modeling and ground level 3D modeling uh, technology. Um, so we are able to provide full uh, building permit drawings uh, for businesses. Uh, we also do aerial inspections that, uh, you know, mostly buildings, uh, solar roofs. We can also do wind and infrastructure. Um, we also do work with uh, geospatial, so mapping as well as spatial analysis. And we're just moving into uh, getting a partnership with uh, someone in uh, land surveying. Uh, so we're going to attempt to do that as well. Um, and I can talk a little bit about the digital media side. Yeah, so for the digital media, the way we approach it is we try to go to businesses and provide a complete solution. So uh, that consists of three major uh, services that we provide. So our drone media, so photos, video, FPV, interior FPV footage, and then 3D virtual tours. So they're just like interactive ways, probably seeing like real estate tours or like Google Maps, so you can navigate through spaces. And then we also capture spaces just with photography and we do like the editing in house. And then another service we provide is just event media, aerial event media. And recently we were approved by Transport Canada to provide training. So we provide the basic and advanced uh, exam preparatory courses. Um, we also do TC certified uh, our past uh, flight reviews and uh, we do flight training at our uh, office in Burlington as well. Okay, so we thought we would uh, go over a couple of projects that we've done recently, uh, just to give you an idea of some of our workflow more on the professional side of things. Um, so one of them is a project we did for the Ash Group Cement Company. Um, they have a plant in Mississauga. Uh, so we did a preheater tower inspection as well as some other modeling for them. Um, so we'll go over that. Very recently, actually, about a month ago, we did a project in Ajax for a restaurant. Um, this was more of an architectural project. It was done in partnership with our uh, architectural firm that we work with, uh, where we did uh, a 3D model, exterior model, building information uh, model, as well as uh, building as built the building plans. Um, so we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. All right. So uh, this is a project we did with uh, Ash Group Cement Company, and they really needed us to um, map the area, map the entire site and model it so and as well as the uh, preheater tower inspection where we took thermal um, photos and, and provided the report to them so uh this site it was a pretty large site and 230 acres and it was kind of a full day job so we really had to plan it out we met with their uh, team and kind of discussed what they were looking to do so because it was in operation we had to, um, and you can't fly drones overhead of people unless you have a parachute. And they really wanted us, um, like they requested that we just maybe shut down parts of the um, 
plant so that way we could map it out. Uh, so we went through, uh, we planned it out in drone deploy and had different segments. So we could also uh, keep visual line of sight with the drone. Then uh, during the project, a few, um, A few, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A few things that we took into consideration um, was the airspace that we were in. We were in uh, G, so all good. Uh, and then some of the other considerations was it was winter. So our pilots were on site in her time, seven hours, very cool. So we just had to make sure to take turns. We were wearing proper PPE, hard hats, vests, warm clothing. And some of the obstacles and threats that were on site was that there was a chimney stack. Uh, we were flying at 400 feet, so we had to make sure to avoid this because it was uh, a lot taller. So we just made sure to plan around it. And can I just say something? Else? Yeah. It was just uh, the chimney is quite tall. I was on site for this one, so. Uh, chimney was quite tall, so just making sure we had line of sight with that when the drone was passing by in case there was any, you know, deviation from its path, we would uh, have a procedure in place for us to stop the flight immediately. Um, as not mentioned, the other thing was we worked with the safety team in Ash Group and they, even though we could provide a solution with the parachute, they just didn't want to have anything to do with it and they shut down, basically, as not mentioned, their plant in segments for us to map at each segment separately. And so everybody, all their workers, this is a huge site, had to go indoors for that portion of uh, the time that we were mapping that segment. So those are some of the challenges that we had with the planning and so on. Yeah, and then on the next slide, you can kind of just see um, just the entire space that we mapped out and modeled. And I think in a little bit, you'll be able to see, those are all the photos that we took and you can see around the preheater tower there, a higher density of photos and in drone deploy uh it's nice it's a nice tool because when we deliver it to clients then they're able to click on the photos and for the inspection they can really see the high resolution photos close up and as well as thermal yeah and uh, because we use drone deploy because it is online based and it has that advantage of collaboration and being able to send that to the client um, so the fact that we uh, were able to send those images to them, and this is a huge, huge site, like uh, it's kind of hard to tell the scale of it, but when you're there, that preheater tower is like a 40 story building and being able to get all those images, uh, that was kind of the main advantage of, of using that tool. Mm -hmm. And we also use uh, Microsoft's Metashape to, to deliver the model uh, and just trim the model. Yeah. Uh, so this was another project that we did recently. It was a restaurant renovation. It's about 6,000 square feet in, uh, in Ajax. Um, so the things that we delivered for this uh, on our end uh, were the uh, 3D interior and exterior models, the as-built uh, building plans, and the building information model. Um, so again, in terms of safety, uh, before every project, we do a safety assessment. For this one, it was in a plaza that's pretty uh, you know, pretty hectic. There's a Costco there, so there's a lot of traffic. Um, so just looking at uh, that, we had to, uh, you know, make sure that we were uh, cognizant of uh, bystanders and, and aware of that sort of issue. So um, with using a parachute, it does reduce the flight time uh, a decent bit. So uh, for this situation, because the area that we were actually mapping didn't have a high enough tra uh, traffic, uh, we felt it was just better to fly without that and pause the flight in case there was a, a bystander nearby, which I don't think actually happened. Um, so that was okay. In terms of meteorological conditions, we actually ended up going out twice. The first time that we went out, um, we expected the winds to be within uh, what our tolerances were, but uh, they didn't end up being, they were a bit higher with the gusts. So we ended up having to go out again another day to map it. Um, so that was kind of the issues there. Uh, airspace, uh, this was in class G, so no prior approvals were necessary for that. Um, in terms of obstacles, there's just a few wires. When we do the sort of model, the photogrammetry modeling for uh, being able to create BIMs, we have to get enough data of the exterior, uh, especially low down for buildings. So flying lower down, um, you know, being aware of uh, other buildings and uh, power lines and that kind of stuff is, is more 
relevant there. So that was kind of some of the challenges that we faced. Um, so that's kind of the planning and on site. Uh, some of the softwares that we used were uh, Matterport, uh, Drone Deploy, uh, Metashape and Autodesk's uh, uh, Revit and AutoCAD. So this is the Drone Deploy model over here that we created of the, uh, it's a Buffalo Wild Wings that they're renovating. Um, so we are able to kind of see this and it's also a great collaboration tool for uh, our partner architects and their clients and, uh, and having everybody work together because generally on this sort of project, there's engineers, there's other people involved and their firms involved. And so having an online tool where they can go through and doc if there's a documentation of what's there, they can see and collaborate and, and work on the design that way. Um, that's really helpful. And of course, it's all the high resolution photos. In this case, uh, 1,305 photos that we did take of the exterior. Um, so if you go to the next slide, this is the 3D model. We use a software called Matterport. It basically lets you uh, go through and creates a 3D interior uh, model and uh, virtual tour. So again, as a collaboration tool, this is really useful as well because people can look around and see exactly what the space looks like. They can see, you know, for example, the ceilings, the beams, uh, where light fixtures might be, um, and all sorts of things without having to send another team to go out and, and check different things. So that's really helpful and time-saving for, um, for architects and the firms that we work with. So next slide. This is the Revit model that we created, the building information model. Um, so we use the data both from the interior and the exterior uh, 3D models to create this. Um, this again allows the uh, architect who's designing the renovation to this to have a jumping point. So they have all the as-built information here um, and they can work from that. Uh, so this is uh, what we do. We work with uh, somebody who's a draft person and a 3D modeler to do this. Um, and then on the next slide here, these are some of the plans that we created, a uh, site plan, a, a floor plan, next one, just go through them really quickly, roof plan, uh, the reflected ceiling plan, and uh, next ones are just elevations here. So um, one after that as well, just another set of elevations. So these plans, again, in AutoCAD, uh, provide that basis for that architectural firm to have, um, uh, to do their design on top of, and having uh, do, using the 3D modeling both uh, ground-based and um, aerial allows us to get all that data really quickly and efficiently for uh, optimizing that workflow. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do, some of the projects that we've done. Um, I think we're doing questions at the end, so don't know who to for that, but uh, I will talk uh, later with you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you, Nat and Dan. Uh, next up, we've got Omar Akinich, who's a drone and geomatic specialist at GHD. Omar is also an alumni of the Faculty of Environment here at the University of Waterloo, acquiring both his bachelor's and his master's of science in geography and environmental management. Omar and I spent a lot of time together during those years, and his ability to mix and conduct comparative analysis between drone and satellite data was incredible and impressive. His diverse technology, uh, technical, his diverse technical skill set, as well as his great personality, is what's likely led to his position at GHD. And with GHD, Omar pilots a number of different RPAS technologies, uh, which we'll see some of today. He's also in charge of developing software for processing and analyzing RPAS imagery for the use of machine learning and GIS for a range of clients across North America. So please join me in welcoming Omar up to the front. Um, personality, I, I guess it's a good thing. If it's Derek saying it's a good thing. Um, my name is Omar Dinich. As Derek said, I work for uh, GHD. A little introduction about myself. Um, I was sitting where you guys were sitting just a few years ago. Uh, I was a student in geomatics before coming into a master's with Derek because he showed me drones and I like drones and uh, it's been smooth sailing ever since. Um, after, after fishing out my master's, I started working for GHE, which is a consulting company just down the street on, on Philip, and I've been a drones and geomatics specialist with them for about two years now. 
Um, my focuses are mostly around kind of vegetation and uh, applying drone drone technologies and that for vegetation analysis, um, as well as incorporating that into programming, trying to automate lots of processes and trying to get some metrics and products out of that. So as a little, little bit of a background before my, my working, I did do a master's thesis with uh, Charming Derek over here. We we're looking quite uh, different than we do now. Uh, in that photo. But uh, Derek and I worked on kind of integrating drones into agriculture, trying to compare uh, the accuracies, the usability of drones for determining uh, certain metrics for agriculture compared to existing methods, yield data collection and satellite uh, imagery collection. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of drones at GHD. So I'm part of the drones and geomatics crew. We have kind of a small little fleet of a whole bunch of fun technology that we uh, do a lot of projects with. We are consulting based, so the amount of variation in projects is constantly constantly changing, and we're we're kind of tackling a whole bunch of different issues. Um, so our kind of bread and butter, as we like to call it, is is the uh, the lidar. Lidar is a great technology. We, we saw some of the examples that uh, Dr. Robinson put out there. And, Discuss. Um, it's a great technology because it's it can be very very accurate in that from a airborne system, which is usually a trade off. When you're sending something up in the air, you're you're usually losing out on some accuracy or precision there. But lidar's uh, penetration and uh, accuracy is is uh, very very useful for a, a wide range of applications. Um, a great a great other aspect of lidar is you can use it during the day or when you're going around and just capturing imagery to create photogrammetry or whatever, um, as soon as that sun starts going down in December, no, nah, it's not happening. Uh, you're you're going to have to cut that flight cut that flight short. LiDAR can just con continue going and collecting uh, collect that data. So, kind of one, the, the the products or deliverables that we at GHD do with LiDAR is kind of split into two pieces. Um, LiDAR can collect stuff in multiple returns, as it's called, which basically, in the case, it'll shoot one laser and then it'll shoot another laser in our case. And what you can do with, with those laser returns is you can have all this data, nice little canopies, uh, shapes around there of non ground features, but you can also permeate through that kind of stuff and get just a bare earth. So we work with both that data. We work with uh, processing bare earth models for creating visual terrain models for construction companies and, and planning as well as conservation. But we also can just clearly extract these trees and stuff from the data and get metrics for stuff like uh, vegetation analysis, again, conservation, and asset collection. Uh, we, we just finished up a huge project in Carson, California, where we completely digitized the city by extracting all of its assets from LiDAR and creating an entire GIS database of the entire area so that they can know what assets are where and uh, when they need to be up. So the other aspect that we work with, which is near and dear to my heart, is uh, multispectral uh, analysis. So multispectral uh, red, green, blue waves, but also integrates red edge and near infrared. So the use of those types of uh, spectral wavelengths can allow us to study how vegetation is performing. Uh, um, lots of time when, when you see work multispectral analysis, it's, it tends to be looking at NDVI and trying to see is a tree happy or is a tree sad and kind of ending it uh, there. What we've been trying to integrate with, with multispectral analysis has been uh, things like going into landfills that have potential for leachate or other uh, chemical abundance uh, abundances in areas which are usually harmful and can cause uh, nearby water bodies to be affected. And going through flying the multispectral and seeing is there some vegetation that's an anomaly, something that's growing way bigger than it should be. There's probably a reason it's growing that way because it has a ton of, of nutrients and, and chemicals available for it. So we're able to then pinpoint potential areas where uh, we can tell um, uh, a, a landfill company to say, there's probably something leaking out of there. You should probably take a look at that because it's hidden away unless you look at something like vegetation. 
Um, another thing which uh, Eric also talked about was um, detecting um, species and that. So there's lots of invasive species that come through and kind of just mix into other vegetation and lots of conservation authorities, lots of governments want to get that stuff removed, but they don't want to send someone out there walking around some swampy, swampy, mucky area trying to say, there's one here, let me yank it out. We were able to go around and actually fly the drone and map these locations and pinpoint them so we can send uh, conservation authorities or other uh, companies to go and remove or spray these invasive species instead of doing a mass spray or mass destruction of the area to try to mitigate uh, the issues. Next slide, please. Uh, and the third kind of big thing that, that uh, we do at GHD is a very, very common one where usually what you guys think of when you see drones first time is uh, mapping and surveying. So uh, along with, with the LIDAR, we, are, we tend to create photogrammetry products, which is creating uh, terrain models and 3D point clouds from just imagery, not LIDAR. Uh, it tends to have some of its limitations, but it's much quicker and reduces redundancy because you're usually, if you're going out somewhere and you're mapping out an area, you might as well create a 3D point cloud and the data that you collected anyway. You can give it to a client, they'll, they'll usually be happy, or you can use it in areas where there isn't too much vegetation, not too much stuff that you need to filter out to get a bare earth ground, a uh, bare earth model. Be able to just uh, just send the surveying uh, up there, and then of course we're also able to create very high resolution imagery products. People like to see what their places look like, and that's usually a nice little cherry on top on top of the um, digital surface or, or something like that. So that's so I um, I kind of tackled the discussion about some challenges with drones. Um, for people maybe like you guys that might be considering what is a drone? What they look awesome, they can do everything type of stuff. Maybe I'm gonna do a cut start up a company or something with it. Um I, I kind of tackled it from, from that aspect because I I know when you're in the industry, there can be different challenges that you have. When you're starting off, you're like, what are the what are the kind of basics? So uh, next slide, please. Big ones is cost. Um, when I started with Derek in my master's, I was going through literature. I think every single paper started off with drones are a cost effective method of doing XYZ. Well, they're cost effective when you compare them to a satellite that costs a billion dollars to get sent up into the sky or paying a surveying company to go and cover a huge area and manually go and collect stuff. They are, they are. Um, but I haven't got a billion dollars and probably lots of you don't either. And that, so, um, Drones can be good, but at the same time, they can get super expensive. The issue is how much do you be paying for it? What 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 do you need uh, for for your company and stuff? Do you need a five hundred dollar drone, or do you need a fifty thousand dollar drone? And also, lots of the time you buy drones nowadays, they don't come with payloads and that. So you got a little camera on it, but then you get asked to to create the lidar products or something like that. That's even more, and that you don't have that. So that's another another investment that you that you have to have to put in there. Um, and the third thing is maybe you went and you bought all these cool technologies that that you heard make lots of money and that, and then you go out into the market and it turns out there's ten thousand other lidar people uh, in Kitchener Waterloo already collecting data, and the market's lower. And find clients. Uh, next slide, please. So kind of with dealing with that kind of stuff, when you start off as a smaller company, you want to focus on maybe one to two smaller, smaller things um, to, to, to do and stuff. You don't want to go buy 50 different products. You just want to go through and, and have a, a few. Uh, uh, another, another kind of uh, limitation is batteries. So we, we go, uh, and, and fly these drones, but batteries can greatly limit what kind of projects we can apply for, what kind of what kind of um, data affected by different different temperatures. We have hot, cold weather and stuff here. We have um, different types of projects and need drones to fly at a higher battery and be gone in the blink of an eye. So uh, next slide, please. Some of the uh, some of the ways for dealing with 
with that kind of an issue is planning ahead of time or being able to, uh, to plan ahead, make efficient flight plans to not have to keep going back and uh, reflying an area that's just flying up to 90 meters can drain if you're doing, if you're doing some work. Keep your batteries in warm conditions. Keep them in the truck if you're out somewhere. Keep them in the car. Don't let them sit out because that's going to cost you valuable time down the road for uh, for trying to warm them. And also, one of the big things I learned is putting lipo batteries, which is the majority of drone batteries, um, in storage mode. We're not using them for months because those guys degrade really quickly and end up costing a lot afterwards. Ah, excellent, please. And what, uh, sometimes you look at a project and you think, okay, uh, I want to use drones, but everything here says I can't use drones right now. I, can't, I don't have enough batteries. I don't have the technology. Sometimes you just don't. And I know that's against the theme of this talk, but sometimes it's better to go through and look at the channel for your drones and not like live or whatever. Let's see, is there other truck to, to go and collect the same amount of data and collect this kind of stuff and then take that money that you get from taking that project, reinvest it back into, into your drones, buy that more uh, more battery packs, buy that better payload to be able to actually expand your work down the road um, and say no to larger projects. So, yeah, uh, we're in an exciting field. Great times and I have lots of cool technology. Um, hope I was able to give a little bit of information about kind of starting up in that. If you guys want to talk drones or you have any sort of business business kind of uh, thank you for uh, thank you, Lisa and Derek for inviting me and the audience members. Thanks so much. Thank you, Omar. Last but not least, we have our final panelist for today, who's Ryan Rizzo, Chief Executive Officer for TerraSky. Supporting his CEO position is a technical background that includes his advanced RPAS flight reviewer status. He's a triple certified surveyor, and he has a passion to embrace the creative potential of different digital media with TerraSky's data collection. His passion has directed TerraSky to take on a variety of different projects span from infrastructure inspection to environmental modeling, and some of which you'll get a chance to see here today. However, in addition to standard product delivery, TerraSky also collaborates with construction partners and government agencies in the research and development of 3D mapping software, new sensors, and methodologies and workflows. So please help me welcome Brian to the front. Hey, Hi, I'm Ryan with TerraSky. Uh, we're a group of um, nomads, sort of. Well, there's about seven to ten of us on a good day. Uh, we do everything from, like as Derek said, uh, well, we basically just don't say no to work. So somebody will call us and we'll say yes, and we'll figure it out on, on the fly. Uh, for example, uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Transport Canada called us a couple years ago uh, to help them do uh, a research uh, to study the entanglement scar tissues on the gray whales in the Gulf of the St. Lawrence. And uh, so we had to put together a concept to how to chase whales with drones. Um, and this is uh, just a shot that we got by fluke. That's not even um, a, a gray whale, that's actually a humpback. This is what you call bubble feeding. Uh, so the whales will swim around in a circle and they'll release air and oxygen, uh, getting all the, the little fish to come up and then they come up and uh, I wish I knew that I could have played videos because I would put some videos in here because it's pretty cool. Um, so this is just like one of the jobs that we do, uh, chasing whales on boats. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is what we were there to actually do um, was to uh, catch the gray whales and look for the entanglement scar tissue. So we would follow them. So for about 60 days, we we're on the St. Lawrence River uh, on Zodiacs in the middle of the summer wearing skidoo suits because it's so cold. Um, and then when you stop, it's really hot. So then you got to take it all off. And then you got to figure out how to take your drone off in this uh, in this really weird environment with waves and everything. Um, there's us in the background. That would be like our work environment for the day on this job. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, we also work with the CN Tower. We do all their inspections and we work with a super cool architecture firm and uh, Quadrangle. So we work with uh, several different kind of uh, facades and BIM and as build stuff. Uh, this is a project we're currently working on. Um, this is the replacement of the gantry on the CN Tower. Uh, gantry is this thing here uh, that's uh, new and they were putting it up there. So they hired us to come and fly. Uh, and uh, build a digital twin of the CN Tower, um, which sounds easy, but uh, it's not. <laughs> uh, like you guys were mentioning, we have to have a parachute, and sometimes uh, they cause more problems than, uh, than they're supposed to. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, that's okay, go back. Yeah, so just to give you like a bird's eye view of what we we're doing, this is the, the gantry. So what they did was they lifted it all the way up and we followed it. And with some of our drones, we can tell what the wind speed is. So uh, they're using us to determine whether or not they could lift it. Um, and of course we did this uh, you know, on one of the busiest Labor Day weekends uh, where there were probably, I think you know, I was saying earlier, it was the day that they sold the most amount of hot dogs. <laughs> and yeah, like we're flying a drone with all these people. Uh, next slide, please. We do a lot of things, like I said, like we don't say no. Uh, this is a 3D camera that we built and uh, attached to the bottom of one of our drones. And we built uh, uh, a walkthrough for the National Film Board of Canada for a virtual reality tour. Um, uh, yeah, uh, that was nuts. Uh, again, we just don't say no to work and we just kind of figure it out as we go along. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we do a lot of turbine inspections. I think over the past two years, we did about 1,000 turbines. Uh, this year, we're going to be doing the same. Uh, we travel all through Canada doing turbines. Uh, last year, we did the whole East Coast, uh, which was kind of fun. This year, we're going to just focus uh, in, um, uh, in Ontario. Uh, this is a great opportunity because uh, we get to use LiDAR. We'll work with a lot of uh, new platforms that are experimenting with new ways of uh, monitoring. Lot. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is like, again, don't say no to jobs. Uh, some guy asked us to do a bridge inspection um, and uh, we got there and there was like maybe two feet of uh, space between the actual water and the bottom of the, of the bridge. Um, so what we decided to do was come back when it was cold and threw, like the water was frozen over because you can get under there and you're trying to fly in this really small space likelihood of I'm flying, the props will hit the top and it'll fall down into the water. So I wanted to do it when it was cold out uh, and the ice would have been there. But when we arrived on site, there was no ice and we already got paid. So I went for it and, uh, <laughs> and it worked. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we do a lot of, uh, we work with a company called Intuitive. Uh, they're a structural engineering firm based out of Calgary. Uh, we do uh, a lot of bridge inspections and uh, LIDAR mapping for them. Uh, and then we, uh, yeah, we know where all the new cool bridges are around Ontario and there's a whole bunch of new ones coming up uh, for the summer. Uh, next slide. Uh, we work closely with Ellis Dawn. Uh, it's a construction company. They're really good friends of ours. Uh, this is the Portland <laughs> picture. Actually, I just noticed this, but if you tilt it, it looks like a finger. <laughs> Actually, uh, but this is the Portland's project, uh, downtown Toronto. This is uh, like Billy Bishop Airport is right here. And we're right here and we're flying at 400 feet. Uh, we do this on a bi-weekly basis. We're monitoring um, the flood protection program. So essentially what they're doing is they're rerouting the Don Valley River, uh, which is gonna come through here and uh, through this way. Uh, we played an integral role in documenting this project from the very beginning and we're there till 2028. Um, it's kind of fun. I mean, they, they hired us to go to Dartmouth and follow these bridges. They built the bridges in Dartmouth and then they floated them on uh, barges uh, down the St. Lawrence River. And uh, we had a team that followed the barge uh, and videotaped the, the bridges floating on the St. Lawrence River. Um, this is our mapping job that we do every two weeks. Um, it's just photogrammetry. I mean, it's not just photogrammetry. I've been doing it for so long, it seems easy, but. Uh, it's really complex. I mean, we're dealing with a lot of different variables on this job. Uh, we've got about 30 different ground control points. Uh, we work with a software called uh, Propeller. Uh, where we use these, um, uh, they're called arrow points. Um, and um, the platform is really good. The client really likes it. Um, and yeah, I'm in constant communication with Billy Bishop because we have everything from 
orange helicopter to uh, Drake coming and landing on his little helicopter pad to go to the Rebel nightclub uh, to uh, military planes coming in for a landing to gas up. I mean, it's like uh, there's always something going on uh, over there. Um, it's pretty stressful, but it's uh, it's pretty fun. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just like a view of, of that actual project. Um, the photo we took, I guess, last year. These are just two of the bridges uh, that were installed. So essentially the new river is going to come through here and go through there. And uh, currently they're starting to do all the planting. So uh, Derek and I were in discussions with the client to uh, discuss like different ways of monitoring the growth of the new plants, uh, maybe some carbon monitoring or even just some uh, growth uh, of the plants. Uh, the health. Um, yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, about three years ago, I was uh, contracted to work uh, with um, uh, an organization called Canada C3, and I sailed from Toronto to Victoria through the Northwest Passage, and I was the drone pilot on the ship. Uh, we stopped in all different indigenous communities along the way and, uh, and taught um, inclusivity and technology and science and environmental sciences. And uh, yeah, so I was working specifically on like mapping and surveying the coastal parts of Canada that uh, a lot of people have never been or have been or will go. Um, and sometimes we ran into polar bears. So uh, we were actually like working with the scientists on board to uh, gather the threshold, like to see how close we could get to like um, animals and things without actually interfering them in their natural environment. Um, and this was one of the polar bears that we had on our mission. This is cool. There's a really cool video on my uh, on my YouTube. On, I think she's looking at me now. Um, next slide. Uh, yeah, so that's it. So this is just the CN Tower, uh, the kind of work that we do in downtown Toronto. And uh, thanks for having me to talk about what I do. Super. So now when I'm looking for my summer tour of exciting bridges, <laughs> I know where to go. Um, so next up, we're going to have a, a panel and discussion session. I want to thank our industry partners for their presentations this morning. And um, we're going to accept uh, Q&A questions online. We'll sit up here and, and uh, field those questions. And anybody in the audience has a question, you can ask them as well. Uh, so I welcome my, our panelists to join me at the front here. This is going to come over here. Okay. So I'll start with the class. Does anybody from the class have any questions? I've got tons. <laughs> yeah, Brandon. Just a question about the drone spraying. Uh, so mentioned with uh, the rotary wing, like the quad copter, and the quad copter, so general drones, so it's not a quad copter, which is a lot of spread to the side. So would a fixed one be more beneficial? Yeah, when the like the MRA is looking at some of the modeling, they are starting to consider the uh, fixed wing will be different uh, rules than rotary wing. Uh, that's again we on that side that you want to see rotary wing versus the fixed wing aircraft. Uh, the problem is the model doesn't exist, and even on this, uh, actually, I've had discussions with the manufacturers of fixed wing. Um, well, the common models that you're seeing developed even here in Canada, they'll do a vertical takeoff with either four rotors facing up and they'll flip forward go forward. But again, if you look at an actual air tractor or something when they're flying, uh, the deposition because of the prop wash actually does vary side to side. But now we're producing two different rotors and props even forward facing. Okay. So, uh, I'm just kind of curious how the modeling will actually face it out versus using like an air tractor. As but yeah, the, it seems like the drift modeling is a lot straightforward more. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Brennan. All right, we've got a question from Nick also in the class who was asking, and it's a, a great question because our course is actually composed of aviation and geography students. And we've got a couple of trained pilots on board here. And the question is about what motivated you guys to maybe leave the idea of 
And maybe I'll add to that and say, what do you see are some of the benefits of working with drones as opposed to a career as a pilot? Uh, and I'll yeah, start with Dan and then we'll come back. Sure. So, so in my case, uh, motivation was no jobs. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I when I was in, uh, I was talking to Derek actually, I think a little while ago, I was saying like, you know, when I was uh, in university, uh, I never really thought I'd be working with drones. I, I took this course, I thought it was really fun. Uh, you know, I got my basic and advanced license, but I uh, I never thought I'd be working with drones. I thought I'd be flying, you know, uh, commercial planes. So, uh, but I graduated, um, there were no jobs, like I mentioned, and uh, and I thought it was a great opportunity to uh, work on something different that I, you know, was just exciting, uh, still within the aviation industry. Um, so, uh, you know, we started kind of like a little project that you do in school, right? It wasn't ever started as like a big company or that kind of mindset. It's just like a startup. And it grew from there. And then now, obviously, the aviation industry is a bit better. And you know, I'm sure there's opportunities out there for commercial pilots, but um, we're doing okay. So uh, just continuing with that for now. Okay, is there any other questions from the audience? We're trying to navigate the online materials in order to get questions. All right, well, that gives me an opportunity to ask everybody. Oh, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I guess I kind of look at the other end where I spent a long time doing it. <laughs> um, I spent a lot of time as a bush pilot and, you know, the pictures of the Arctic, I've been there tons, and then probably all those communities. Uh, very interesting. Um, we kind of changed away from being going to the airlines when we started having kids and family life kind of necessitated uh, not being stuck in the remote Arctic for a month in a blizzard. Um, so uh, uh, essentially going to the airlines and it's a completely different world there and after three years plus there like I look at my roster and it'd be like 340 hours in a month that I'd be on duty, which is basically from the time you show to the time you're released. It's a long time in hotel rooms. And uh, so, you know, we uh, kind of, uh, you know, that we can farm and get their own stuff and that way instead of just put the headset. All right, I'm going to keep it on the aviation side of, of things for one more question here and say, um, you know, there's a lot, I think, of, of feedbacks that go between the drone industry and the aviation industry. What do you think are some of the impacts that drone activities, drone models, and uh, technologies, how do you think that is actually having an effect on the general uh, aeronautics sector or aviation sector? Do you guys have any thoughts about that? Let me throw out there, like, um, you know, we get miniaturization of inertial measurement units and gyroscopes and things like that that could be reducing the size of the equipment that's on board in small aircraft, which means we've got less weight in small aircraft, which means that we can be more efficiently in our use of fuel or what we can carry. Is there other things that you guys have been thinking about that you could see your experience, especially knowledge of some aviation pilots and students that could impact on industry? I can throw in an example. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we had somebody approach us uh, to, to map a solar farm, and they were using planes before, and it's just more efficient, cost savings, and better data. Right. And similar thing where, again, we're dealing with uh, kind of more traditional layer application methods. And again, our operating costs are significantly lower. Obviously our productivity in a day is less. Uh, for right now, the technology is evolving quickly. Uh, but again, it's kind of a disruptor in terms of uh, we can do things actually quite a bit more economically and again, higher precision. Uh, even we do a lot of like multi-spectral imaging stuff as well. And we've done some quality assurance checks after the helicopters have gone to spray fields for say a fungicide. And you can see the plant health uh, where they didn't spray. And there's obstacles, like I did one field with a big high tension power line running through it. Well, the helicopter pilots don't like to do that because they like to go home and drink beer at the end of the day like the rest of us. So, you know, we could go in and fill those areas that are high risk or again, the little corners that are just not really worth their time. Uh, so they complement each other. Um, the same thing, like we work in invasive species programs. 
we can go hit those little cells and just hit, you know, where it's not even worth the helicopter firing up to come and hit little patches. Uh, it all works really well. Hey, I even thought I'm, I'm not a pilot other than in a flight simulator every now and then. So, uh, but just talking about the effects of aeronautics on drones, improving the efficiencies, the uh, reducing drag, and all those types of things. But we're starting to actually see kind of shift back to seeing um, air transport, aeronautics, and stuff like that being influenced by drones. We're starting to see little vehicles and that that are running like drones, working on battery pro uh, propulsion rather than than gas. For I, I think I just saw a few days ago, like something called zipline or something. Yeah, gas for right. emergency uh, emergency delivery and stuff. Transportations like uh, now with drones that uh, dealing with slightly larger payloads than uh, than a camera. So you guys gave a, a, a number of really great examples of your of different projects that you've all been working on, but maybe tell me what exciting area you'd like to go. If you could expand the work that you're doing in some new way in association with drones and data analyses. Where would you take it? And we'll start with Ryan, so you don't have any time to think about it, and then we'll move down to you. Uh, like I said, we just don't say no uh, to anything. So uh, we'll figure, out, we're constantly trying to innovate on the fly, um, so there's that sense of excitement constantly. Um, uh, but currently, I mean, we're really trying to master finding, uh, well, between client expectations, really. I mean, like that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find a solution to be able to provide a LIDAR solution uh, that is cost effective uh, and uh, produces the level of accuracy uh, that the client is willing to accept and work with uh, in their model. Surprise, surprise, I'm, I'm interested in, in AI and machine learning with the data. Um, and one thing that I've been excited about as well as my team is we're, we're starting to see this abundance of data being collected in the form of LIDAR and form of imagery in that for, for different purposes, for, for driving, for self-driving, all this data is coming in, being used for a small purpose, and then being tossed out. So myself and several of our team are curious about how can we integrate some kind of tool sets and that to, to work with this data, this abundance of data that's being collected to maybe make uh, things like uh, asset detection um, more more automated. Maybe you just driving down the street, you can make 10 bucks for going down King Street because it collects some uh, some assets and stuff that can control. Integrating all this massive data collection into tools can be properly utilized rather than just having a one and done type of uh, work. For us uh, as a company, one of the things that we're excited about is uh, moving kind of beyond just the data capture and basic analysis. Um, so we've had the opportunity to work with some professional firms. And uh, one of the exciting things with that is working kind of collaboratively with them. And so we are actively trying to pursue uh, integrating some of those professional roles, whether it's, you know, architecture related or otherwise. Um, into our company, into our organization internally, and then having that, uh, you know, specialization there as well. So that's something that we're working on. Yeah, just to add on, we're a startup, so lots of ways to expand, lots of ways to, you know, add. Never say no to a job. <laughs> yes, we never do. <laughs> yeah, for us, again, we're, our holdup is more of the health and regulations, so much as besides the stuff become available. We get to kind of look behind the curve when we do pile of research, so we see the efficacy and how the products actually work. We see the dangerous parts, but again, it's uh, you know once this stuff, these tools become available to the general growers or you know even industrial vegetation management or invasive species. Uh, again, we work on projects where we're doing some uh, some sensitive habitats. You know, and usually they go with machines and trample everywhere and cut out these uh, these plants. But we can just sit there in the middle of the marsh and just go and hit. Uh, the cells that we have to take care of. Uh, it's an interesting project that I can't talk too much about. Uh, you know, things like this where it's actually just augmenting our abilities uh, to just be more precise. Super. Yes. Um, 
I'll just rephrase that for our online audience as well, um, and I won't go into as much detail, but generally the question is about how do the uh, panelists feel about the existing um, constraints and rules and regulations on drone activities in Canada, and if that's going to foster or inhibit uh, more activities to take place. Um, I, I think that right now how it stands is is much better than it was just a few applying for specific permits to fly in restricted areas is, is a lot more efficient and, and easier than have to fill up 50 page uh, applications to just fly over a farmer's field in the past. So in, in that regard, it's better. Um, the, the limitation on site here has kind of uh, inhibited some of the growth, I think, for what drones could be doing right now. Uh, understandably so, because it's still a novel technology and that's that's a dangerous kind of thing. But it's, it's starting to see, <clears throat> excuse me, it's starting to seem like Canada is trying to implement that like under big boom uh, in the industry down the road. Like just to add to that, like I do feel that uh, Canada has really like put an effort into help uh, support the innovation in, in, in the industry. They, for a while, they were kind of blocking us because we didn't really know what the technology was and you know how we're going to take down an airplane with our Mavic. Uh, but now it's there's everything's a lot faster, right? Like there's that site in real time. Uh, which has uh, really allowed us to, uh, you know, uh, get things going quicker. Thanks, guys. Um, we have a question from online, which I think is is probably partly stemmed by the activity of drones in the media and its use in in the wars in Ukraine and, and Russia. Um, and the question is perhaps more of a software question, and maybe Omar, I'll direct it to you at first. They're curious about uh, object recognition. I'm asking particularly about uh, military objects uh, and, and their ability for recognition, but let's keep it broad and say um, how how accurate uh, are the, the current algorithms and, and softwares that GHD has been using because you talked about isolating individual features from your LiDAR data and photogrammetry data at um, object detection and recognition. So we don't have too much experience with military-based stuff, uh, but on on um, on an asset kind of base level, we've had a lot of uh, success coming down to to seven, almost seven meter um, precision in, in that regards, right? And accuracy um, dealing with objects such as uh, signs, trees, lights, and all that um, has been quite easy and quite accurate uh, with the data that we've been. There's some great tools out there, for example, the Bentley Suite and that Topo, Topo Dot and, and similar that are honestly able to, to go in and extract uh, these types of objects at the, at the click of a button and that you can get thousands of thousands of these uh, objects just being extracted. That's because the LiDAR really goes through and captures an entire object that you can train your data on rather than just a few pixels that you say these three pixels symbolize a, a, a tree or something like that. You have a full, full uh, excited about is, is trying to incorporate object detection more on board on drones because currently lots of lots of the um, for example, DGI software, they can recognize a face, they can recognize a hand uh, to, to try to navigate and, and the, some things in front of them. But um, the computational requirements for actually being able to grab an object as you're flying over, process it on board, and export a file is still something that.
that kind of answers uh, the question. That's great. Would I have to add to that one? All right, then I'll, I'll we'll wrap this up with one final question, which is, do you have advice for the audience who might be interested in getting involved in the drone industry um, or working with drones about how they should go about do it or skills that they should uh, focus on, on learning in order to make themselves marketable to, to companies like you all are working for? Say uh, just do everything right the first time. <laughs> like, like learn how to like unlock, get as much experience as you can flying, but do it right. Like, don't be like kamikaze pilot and uh, go out there and chuck, like, try to follow the rules as you go along because you'll yourself when you're looking for an employment opportunity later. Happening in the industries, a lot of people are just buying drones at Best Buy and going out there, uh, and but they're but just unusable because they didn't have the proper permissions, uh, they didn't probably unlock uh, properly, or they don't have their, the proper certification. Just go for it and get it all right the first time and just keep on implementing that into your workflow because if you want to work in the industry, it's going to be mandatory. Anyway. a great space right now because 10 years ago if you want to get into drone stuff it would either be for uh, basically for, for actual academia stuff but now it's been an entire kind of merger You're connecting it with construction with with the environment with uh, still photography and that if that's your if that's your cup of tea it's very accessible so Finding kind of what what your focus is and what you like to do. Start and also, like Ryan said, um, go accessible and not expensive. It's like ten bucks, and uh, get that stuff done. What, uh, log some hours, uh, but sign up for for a website that you can upload your flight logs to get your hours on there it's great for resume building and for cv uh, building so that you can say i've flown here i've flown there i've flown x number of hours i actually know what i'm doing and then just uh, go best spot. same as uh, they said you know get a drone fly and try to learn some new softwares you know um doesn't you can often get an education version since you guys are in university and try to learn some new softwares, try to experiment with it, play around with it. Um, another thing too, like I was in your shoes, I was literally sitting in, in these classrooms uh, not that long ago. So um, it's just a network. It's just to go out and be involved. If there's opportunities to get involved, um, you know, while you're at university, it's a really good idea to do that because I did that when I was there. And honestly, that's helped me out so much. And uh, I, I think just generally in, in life, that's a good, good uh, mentality to have, just to go out and try new things and network with people. Yeah, um, I think another thing is, at least I know in uh, my JS classes, everybody said JS is a tool, and you're using that tool to do apply it to different applications. And I kind of look at drones the same way. And now a lot of companies and municipalities, they're using drone technology to do certain applications. So I think it would be, um, you know, a good idea to go into a field and learn about it and see how you can apply drones. Yeah, I would say uh, I'd shy away from manual flying. Uh, I see a lot of drone pilots that, you know, swipe the take off and on it goes and then some wasn't programmed, right? It's just, oh, oops. Uh, so, yeah, don't be afraid of manual skills. Same thing like with our spray drones and stuff. Like, we're always tight to obstacles, that sort of stuff. Uh, and flying is something that you should actually be really proficient at, even when it comes to emergency situations and traffic uh, avoidance maneuver, that sort of stuff. Uh, just having manual control and understanding how to fly it um, really goes a long ways. And same thing, being professional, again, getting your uh, all your certifications. Uh, another thing too, people always overlook is insurance. Like everything's fine and dandy until you have um, M300 land in Toronto and uncontrolled. You know, that can get really expensive really quick. And that was, again, kind of like Canada's drone industry doesn't have a high barrier to entry right now. You can go to Best Buy, you know, and do real estate photos and flip flops. All right. Well, at some point, you know, big firms and stuff, do you want that credibility, that accountability? You know, it's sometimes dorky to be in a safety vest, but, you know, you're out on a construction site, they're going to want all this PPE sort of stuff. So, you know, when you show up, 
and they have you know, no idea what it's like to be on a job site, just learning more of this kind of the standards and bringing yourself up a little higher. Super. OK, I'd like to, to give a huge thank you to our panelists today. on our various social media platforms. All are linked on the WISEN webpage, which is uiru.ca slash WISEN. Subscribe to our newsletter and future updates. And thanks again, everybody, for coming. Hope you all have a great day.